Hallelujah. Lord, we welcome your spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. In your house, mighty God, we stand humbly. Lord, I pray for everyone that's here, everyone that streams, God, that have paused in their life of pressure and uncertainty to receive a small rhema from heaven today, a word of assurance, a voice of confidence, a clear clarion call from the portals of heaven, God. I pray that you would use me to preach to your precious people, the hearts, the spirits, God, that need a word, a confirmation, as we work through life, Christ, as we work through the things of this world, that your spirit and your prophetic, profound word would inspire and uplift somebody today. Let me be a vessel, God. I humble myself to the spirit today to be used by God. In the name of Jesus, I submit the prayer request. If you agree with that, could you shout back amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. While you're standing, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I want to commend and thank our prayer team that gathers every Friday night at 6.30. Under normal circumstances, it's about a 60-minute time with God that people gather they congregate on holy ground. It's open to everybody. Just show up at 6.30 and you just kind of slip right into a massive prayer room. But I commend them from this last Friday. I got word that it didn't stop at 7.30 this time. And that the Spirit of God ignored the clock. And they went in excess of two hours praying and travailing and uttering and groanings that could not be understood in English. That kind of reminds me about Topeka, Kansas and Azusa Street when the Spirit came in. And so prayer team, we are thankful that we are standing in the afterglow of a Friday night service that connected with the Holy of Holies. And we are the recipients, the beneficiaries. So to the foster team and company, all of you, Thank you, guys. And again, I do do a little promotion here. Friday nights, every Friday night at 6.30, if you ever are in need of a fresh anointing, if there's something in your life that you just need to petition, or you just need to hear the prayers of a church family as you sit in the corner, you are welcome. You are welcome. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 reads as such. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I feel I have a sequel, for, a sequel from last Sunday that the Lord gave me a part two. The screen reflects the King James Version times as I study, I like to just look at other translations and the phraseology. And I want to read you from the Amplified Bible. But listen to it. It says this way, let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature be free from the love of money. Shun greed, be financially ethical, be content with what you have. For he said, I will never under any circumstances, desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I any, ever to any degree leave you hopeless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Wow. That added a few more English words that kind of made me say wow about Hebrews 13.5. I want to preach to you for a few minutes. I want to inspire someone on this title, When God Cannot Be Found. 
when God cannot be found. We prayed. Why don't you put your hands together in agreement as you're seated in the name of Jesus. God bless you for standing. You can be seated here today. When God cannot be found, I've lived long enough to know that there are moments that seemingly that God is nowhere to be found. Yes, I'm identifying that as a pastor. I don't like those moments because we live in the tangible. We live in the natural with the five senses. We need to hear it, see it, smell it, taste it. We need to know that it is there to have confidence. But I've learned long ago that my walk with God is by faith. And faith is not always tangible. Faith is not always visible. But I understand, and you can understand, that when I don't see God, and when I don't hear God, I cannot conclude in my natural mind that God is not there. Even when God's silent, that doesn't mean He's not there. Even when God is distant, that doesn't mean He doesn't care. Again, we are judging the visibility of God based on our circumstances. So if I only have my eyes to see if God's there, that is a very limited view of how big God is. So as I go through life, as I preach to you wonderful people, and I encourage you at times in sessions of counseling, that God is always there. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be there. He will never relax and let his guard down. He says, assuredly not. But this is what is so conspicuous to me as you scan the books of the Bible. The book of Esther is unique to all the books of the Bible. Do you know what makes the book of Esther different than the rest? The name of God makes the difference. The absence of the name of God makes the difference. It's the only book of Scripture with absolutely no mention of God. That seems odd to me as a pastor. That seems very strange. It would seem to be a godless book, maybe. But in fact, it's filled with God. It's filled with His hand. Mixed in the bag of the book of Esther. It's filled with godlessness. There are evil people with evil plans that are trying to annihilate God's people. And it's not just the name of God that's missing, but it's the signs of his presence. Where is God when I need him? Have you ever said that? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever pondered that? Where is God when I really need him? I know in our times, my wife, I've preached before about her two years of depression. She would ask God and ask me, by the way, those are two different people. Where is God when I really need him? I think he's here. I don't see him. I don't feel him. I don't hear him. I've served God this far and this long. For what? Uh, It's going to work out, dear. And there are times in all of our lives that you can identify that you've been in a valley. You've been up against a mountaintop. You've been on the backside of a desert. And even with a telescope, you could not find God. But in the book of Esther, there is darkness that reigns. And nowhere is God to be found. You may wonder this. Is the book of Esther less holy than all the other books in the Bible? I would simply reply, no, not at all. You see, it's the holy of the other books. It's his name that is not mentioned. But that's the point, my friend. Even though the name of God isn't mentioned, the hand of God lies behind every event. I'm here to preach to some people this morning that we have been pushing through a pandemic. Our last known service was March the 15th. But even though we don't see God at times, 
even though he isn't mentioned in your story, please understand this, that the hand of God lies behind every story and every event and every dark time and every valley. I can assure you this, God is always there. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. The horizon changes, the culture changes, the temperature changes, people's opinion change, but God never changes. Can you shout amen? amen. He is there unseen, unmentioned, yet working on all things together and turning every event to his full purpose. I think all of us, including myself, Brother Tony, have these scriptures that we go to. We lean into some scriptures that are powerful because it spoke to us in times of adversity. We lean into some scriptures that we can quote and we can give chapter and verse, and we can sound like a Brother Foster with a couple of scriptures because it spoke to us in times of darkness. I go to my go-to scripture. A lot of them are in Romans. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? It's again in Romans chapter 8. And I am persuaded that nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 34. And we lean into these scriptures and say, hey, no weapon formed against me. Isaiah said this. No tongue formed against me. Why do you say that? Why did that speak to you? Because at times in my life and my ministry, weapons were being formed against me and tongues were being formed against me and saying things that I I never did and I never knew about, but I had to take peace as I leaned into the prophetic word of Isaiah that these shall not prosper. And so I've collected a few along the way in my backpack of life that are valuable to me. And I think all of you have valuable scriptures that you lean into. You don't need the word of God. You don't need to thumb through a Bible but you could quote it like a pristine Bible quizzer in a championship quiz meet because that scripture spoke to you in your time of great need. That scripture spoke to you in your time of hopelessness. And so I bring another scripture to you that I have cradled in my hands this year and that I have leaned into with an intimate relationship. And I understand this, that all things work together for the good of them that are called according to God's purpose. Everything is going to turn out okay. I've got a new revelation of what Paul said. I got a new understanding about that. Oh yeah, I reckon it's going to be okay. Come on somebody. But all things work together. I'm called of God. I'm anointed of God. I'm filled with the Spirit. Even though I can't see God, all things are working to His glory. Can you shout amen? amen. And so I need to remind somebody this morning, whether you're streaming online or you're here in person, that God will never leave us, just like the book of Esther. There is an unmentioned God. He's not seen. He's not mentioned anywhere. You can't validate him. You can't use your five senses to diagnose where God is, but it is the book of the unmentioned God, and it's the book that speaks of all times about your life when we don't feel the presence of God, when you don't hear the voice of God, I want somebody to understand God is there. When you don't see the hand of God, somebody please understand your pastor this morning, God is there. When you don't hear or see his hand, and when you think there is no sign of his love and his purpose, somebody hear me this morning, God is still there. And when it seems like he's far away or not there at all, God is still there. Understand, we can't get mixed up. The devil will step in and play with our mind and our cognitive skills as we judge things. We're trying to judge a holy God through human eyes and through ears and through the natural five senses, but you can't put God in that little bitty box. He is bigger. He is greater. He is more mighty. He is more powerful. Come on, somebody. When God cannot be found, I'd have to ask you the question this morning. With a little bit of sarcasm, if that's okay, don't hold it against me. When God can't be found, I would have to ask you, by who? Is he not found because you can't see him, or is he not found because he's nowhere? Well, you don't have to get sarcastic about it. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll get back on my preacher mode. When you lose something... 
Is it lost because you don't see it? Or it's really never to be found? When I don't hear God, Brother Tim, is he not speaking from the portals of heaven? Or is my ear not hearing the voice of God? So I say, when God cannot be found, by who? By me. Because I'm in the valley. I'm at a moment of distress. Let me just pause and interrupt myself for a minute. That's the value of the church. Because God can be found by somebody somewhere in a church. We're not all tone deaf on the same day. We're not all camping in the valley on the same week. We're not all going through the biggest pressure in our life in the same month. That's why I connect to a church because when I think God can't be found, I promise you there's a prayer group down here on a Friday night shaking the doors of heaven, knocking on the door, communicating with God. Somebody always finds God even if I can't. That's the value of a body of Christ. So maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking God can't be found. I would respectfully this time submit, maybe he can't be found by you right now. But that does not negate the fact that he's still a God alive and well. And so there's no sign of his love. There's no sign of his presence. There's no sign of his hand. There's no mention of his voice. Surely God's not here. Hang on. Not so. And when all you see is darkness, you're looking through the lens of a valley. That's the time of the book that it's the unmentioned God. Again, because God is not mentioned, does that mean that book is less holy? Not at all. Because God was always working through the evil. God was always working through the vile and carnality and wickedness. As they tried to destroy the people of God, he was at work where nobody could see him and nobody could validate him. But somebody in the book of Esther, some godly person said, hey, I don't feel it. I don't see it. I don't hear it. But I'm going to trust in God that he never leaves me or forsakes me. He's as close as the mention of his name. He sticketh closer than a brother. The word of God is chock full of scripture after scripture, promise after promise, validation after validation validation. Even if I can't find God, God is still moving behind the scenes. Can you shout amen? Amen. And I think that it's telling us this. Even though you don't feel his presence, it's still there. Even though I don't see the hand of God, the hand is still moving. Again, this is a walk of faith. We are believing that God is walking with me. I trust, I believe, I validate that everything works together. It's a puzzle piece of my life. There's pieces of my puzzle, of my story, Sister Heidi, that that piece in itself could be just part of the darkness in the sky. But when you interlock them together with who I am and you open the aperture to see what God is doing, wow, that's a beautiful night scene on the coastal waters. That is gorgeous. That looks romantic. I want to go there someday. But if I show you just one piece of the dark sky, you don't want to go there because you don't see the full picture. And we got to make sure we're not judging God on one piece of a puzzle, piece of my story. Let God finish the story. Let God be the painter. Let him be the author. Put the painting brush back in his hand and allow God to keep painting. Can I help somebody here this morning? Here's where people get tripped up with God in church. As God's painting their story and he's in the process of painting maybe some nightfall beautiful sunset along the Pacific Ocean, that's when people get disenchanted at times and they leave God, they take the paintbrush out of his hand and they go back out in the world and paint an old ugly Mm, come on now watch this and even though the night sky over a glistering sunset on the pacific ocean is beautiful that same night sky that once you start painting that god did you paint the rest of the story and it ends up in destruction it's the same black sky overlooking the backside of an alley with someone laying dead in front of a dumpster. Same sky. Wait, wait, wait. Did God do that? No, I started painting here, God saying, you yanked the paintbrush out of my hand, and you start painting over here. 
So what are you saying? I'm just simply saying let God finish the story. We're in a pandemic. I get it. I've never lived through a pandemic. Anybody else? No, we haven't. We know how to figure this out. No, we're making the rules as we go. But I'm not taking the paintbrush out of God's hand because he is crafting the story of the church. And when we zoom out and we get into 2021, 2022, and we look back, we will never forget 2020, my friend. But I'm telling you, as a pastor, I'm not giving up on what God is painting. I'm not discouraged on what God is painting. Let God continue to paint. Some stories take a little longer. The intricacy and all the detail work takes a little bit of time. Our stories are being written and painted. And even though I don't feel his presence, He's still there, his hand's there, his voice is there. Even when I feel abandoned and alone, his love is still there. How do you know? Because we had different vantage points. You see, I'm preaching to someone here this morning, and maybe you're streaming online, and you feel abandoned and unloved. But when you get around the body of Christ, not everybody feels that way, so somebody has overcome the way you feel right now this morning. There's somebody sitting in our midst this morning that has overcome whatever you're struggling with. I'm here to tell you there's living testimonies among us. So whatever the most pressure point in your life is right now, understand this, that there is somebody, I'm positive about this, that not just streaming, but that's in this house today that has gained victory over what you are pressured with this morning. Here's my point. We win. Who's we? The church of the living God. Even when I can't find God, God is blessing somewhere, somehow, something, some person, some family, some situation. Maybe my situation's on pause right now, and he's looping back around because there was a more desperate situation over here that he dispatched angels to help them, but they're on my way. They're coming up my driveway, and I'm letting God finish. I don't see God. I can't find God. Hang on, somebody. Get ready to ring your doorbell. God's on the doorstep, and I'm going to say, look what the Lord hath done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Hey, there is a God. Woo! And at the end of the light, will break through through your darkness. The good will prevail, and you will know that you are never and you were never alone. At the end, in the end. How can you say that? Because I have a confidence in the word of God. I've been connected with the power of God long enough to know how things turn out. A lot of us are living epistles, letters. We have experiences. Our spiritual resume tells us that God ends up putting the dots together, connecting them. God ends up taking the puzzle pieces together. So even though God cannot be found, Grandma, I don't think you struggle with that anymore. Say, hey, I didn't see him today. Oh, so there's no God? No, 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 no. I've done this long enough. What's the old school song that he's an on-time God? Just when you thought he wasn't coming through? Bam! He's an on-time God. He'll wow you. He'll blow it up. He's on time. He's not marching by our time. He's not marching by our clock. He's not marching by our dates. It's 11.09 a.m. in Southern California. That don't matter to God. It matters to us because our life is governed by time. We start at 10 o'clock. We get done. You go home. You go to work. The kids have to study. They have to log on. You have a doctor's appointment. Everything's predicated on time of somewhere you got to be, but that's not the God we serve. And here's the challenge of what we do if we're not careful. We put God on a timetable. Why? Because, Sister Sharice, that's how we live. I don't, I don't know how to live any other place, any other way. I had to be here to preach. Church starts at 10. I set my alarm so I don't oversleep, just in case. Get up in the morning, Brother Tony. We've got things to do. You have appointments in life. But the challenge of the frustrating time, is, especially in a time of darkness, it's when we take almighty God that we say can't be found, and we're judging that because he's not on my time frame. He's not on the landscape of how I equate what life is. 
You got to be at work tomorrow at a certain time, do you not? Or do you just stroll in? Woo! Hey, 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 well, I guess I, could work. I don't mind working with you today. What are we doing? You're fired. No, 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 no. That's why there's called rush hour on the freeways. Because nobody wants to in. So they're all thinking the same thing on the 91. Got to get to work, can't be late. Better leave a little early, never know how chubby. If there's an accident, da, 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 and you live a stressful life, right? Because it's okay. But the problem with that is when we squeeze God into that. And that's when at those times we say, God can't be found. Because God doesn't know time, but the paradox of it is he's an on-time God. I want to say, go figure. Well, here's one for you. Do the math. It doesn't make any sense. So if you're trying to make sense of God, you're going to conclude at times God can't be found. I'm just here to encourage you to say, hey, you know what? Here's another option for you. Let me float past you another possibility when you think, when I think God can't be found. Is God in everything? Yes. Is everything good? No. Do the math. I just heard myself say that. I said, that don't even make sense. But God is in there, right? Whenever you can't see or feel the presence of God in your life, know that he is fully there. It's just your book of the unmentioned God. It's your book of Esther. He was with you all along, and he was holy. It's your time. It's your book. It's your unmentioned God. But here's the thing. The book of Esther didn't get edited out of the Holy Bible. It's left there because it's still, yes, a holy book. And maybe the value of the book of Esther is amped up and ramped up during a pandemic. Because if you put our life in the book of Esther, I understand why they thought, God could not be found. I saw all the chaos, the evil that was prevailing. And so maybe somewhere in our lives, we are our human, touchy, feely, see, hear, five senses. We need a physical example about how God worked through people and situations that I can hang my hat on. You need that? Okay, the book of Esther. Let that be a nail in a sure place. Because God can be found. And for those that are looking for God, watch me now, God will be found. Hello? He will. It's like the old adage, you'll find whatever you're looking for. If you're looking for someone to be nasty and rude tomorrow, if you just look long enough, you'll find someone. Why? Because you're looking for that. I'm just going to go into Starbucks and I'm going to see if anybody's rude to me, bless God. You'll find it. Why? Because you're looking for it. And pastors and parents are they tell their kids, right? When you go to school, just look for the happy people. Just look for somebody smiling and you do, hey. We, that's what we tell our kids. But if we're going to look for a situation, I'm in a bad situation. I'm just going to look. For, I know there's no God here. Well, then you already lost. In your perspective, there is no God. But he's still there. The Jewish people are alive today because God was there even when they didn't see him or feel him. And God is with you. And if you're a child of God in the end, watch this. The light will break through the darkness. The good will prevail in your life and you will know that you were never alone and he was always with you. And it was holy. And it was your time of your book, the book of Esther. When you cannot, when God cannot be found. 
I want to ask the Connollys to join me up here for just a moment. If the two of you will come up here. I want to give you a current story of when God could not be found. I'm asking them to come up here because I want you to see that I'm talking about real people. Why don't you guys just come on? I want everybody to see you. Because this is, this is part of God, where are you? This is the Connolly family, David and Yolene. They have a little 10-year-old boy named David. Most of you know David. She texted me Friday, I think it was Friday. Today, Sunday, Friday. He has some medical challenges. She, at her own confession, hey, this is a miracle baby. She goes, Pastor, little David's ear is swollen. I think the text said his left side of his head was swollen out. we got to take him to the hospital. I said, can you call me so I can pray for you? Friday, is that right? Do I got the days right? Okay. Just last Friday. I'm talking about 10 years ago. And I said, Lord Jesus, and I prayed a pastoral prayer. I heard her crying, and my heart broke for her. What's wrong with little David? Well, he has an infection down deep in his ear, and there's, what was on the bone? What did you call it? Um, infection, like as abscess on the bone. So they take him, and I said, okay, let me know what's going on, sister. So yesterday we texted a few times. We called. She called me. She said, okay, pastor, here's what we're gonna, they're going to do. They're going to go into surgery, cut the back of his ear, scrape the infection off the bone. But they said there's nerves connected to the face, and we're trusting that we don't violate those nerve endings, or his face and smile will not be the same for the rest of his life. And I asked her, I said, are you and your husband okay with this surgery? I asked you that? I said, are you guys signing off on this? Or the I felt, are the doctors ramming this down your throat? No, we're good, we're good. Okay, you, you and your husband have talked and you're at peace. We have to, Pastor. His head is swollen. We have no choice. Okay, let me pray with you again. When's the surgery? I think it was five or six, seven or eight at night. Okay, how long is the surgery? Hour and a half. Text me or call me as soon as you know something. It's kind of how I close out my Saturday night last night when God can't be found. I never heard from her. So I just fell asleep. Well, I guess it worked out. She texted me this morning. I'm up here during worship, okay? Pastor, just want to let you know we're here. And I want to text like, what? Like a WH, a bunch of A's. What? I said, is little David okay? Well, she goes, I have a testimony. When someone says they have a testimony, I don't think, oh, my goodness. So I'm thinking, I'm getting ready to preach when God can't be found. I said, can you meet me in the lobby? So maybe some of you saw me slip out. I can't wait till after church. I want to know what's the testimony. Last I knew, he was on the operating table, and we were begging God that his facial structure and nerves would not be contorted for life. I have a testimony. What? I said, meet me in the lobby. She texts back, okay. So I put my mask on. I stepped out while you guys were just jamming in worship. And she proceeded to tell me the story. She said, last night, Pastor, the operating rooms were full. So they pushed it to 9 o'clock. So we said, okay. And then they pushed it to midnight. And she told me this morning, heart went out. She goes, I went in that room and I, I laid on the floor by my little David and I begged God to do something. If you would have saw her, we'd say, excuse me, what's wrong? You can't find God? 
your little 10-year-old medically challenged boy is going to go into surgery? Or is God? That would have been a fair judgment outside the presence of God. She goes, I cried, Pastor, and I laid there. I laid there. And then they come out to get David. Huh? If I say something wrong, I don't want to mislead because I want, I want them to hear this testimony. They come out to get little David at midnight. And she said to the, what was, how did you say? I, I recant. What did you say? I declined the surgery she had to sign earlier. I declined the surgery for doctors. And she said, one Indian doctor, she goes, I got to give God three days. She goes, I respect your profession. I respect what you do. But now it's time you respect me. A bold mother bear in the spirit. Hello, somebody. When God can't be found. The Indian doctor, she said, told her, hey, I believe you and I respect you. I declined the surgery. I need to talk to God for three days. Where's God? I don't know. Maybe God should have came sooner. Maybe we shouldn't have taken him on Friday. Maybe God should have came on Thursday. Where's God? God can't be found. Wait a minute. If all things work together, David, for the glory, can you imagine a 10-year-old boy that you would have and you're in the hospital? You signed and released for the surgery. If it don't go just right with the nerves, his face could be contorted for life. Or you just let the ear and head swell. Mm. Where's God? I declined the surgery. Little David's still in the hospital. Dave, he's 10 years old. And as she told me this story in the lobby, I got to think, and this is exactly what I'm preaching today. That God wants somebody to hear, you talk about in the middle of an audit. We're going to throw this in the middle of the audit. And this is what I want to do. I felt like the Holy Ghost spoke to me here. If you're able to stand, you can stand with me now. I want this family to see. If I'm in their shoes, I'm thinking God can't be found, man. I'm a human being. That's my natural thoughts. But they belong to a church. That somewhere in the congregation, somebody's finding God. Somebody's not in this situation. Somebody's baby's not in the hospital. We've been through some things. And so somebody says, hey, excuse me, sir. I see God. Excuse me, brother and sister. I see a host of angels. Excuse me, Connolly family. Little David, I see God. Ha ha ha. This is what the, I feel the Lord, I feel strong about this. I, I don't take lightly. I don't blame many things on God, but I feel God told me this. I want this family to see who will, who will partner with me tomorrow that you'll just fast one meal for little David. Easy, okay? Wait, hang on. Keep your hands up. Brother, Le Brother Blair, if your team will get me a count we're for tomorrow, I, what I want to do, I want to count up how many meals are being laid at the Holy of Holies. Hey, excuse me, Lord, this is for little David. Excuse me, Lord, this is for little David Connolly. Excuse me, Lord, this is for little David Connolly. Keep your hand up. I want, to, I want them, okay? These are human beings. I want them to have a number. Any meal tomorrow, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you pick. Say, hey, when I fast, when I push away, this is for little David. One meal, easy. Keep your hands up. I'm My hand's up. My wife's watching a sick child right now, but... Put her hand up. Give us two for my family. A hundred and thirty-five meals are going to be laid at the Holy of Holies tomorrow for a family. Why? Because we see a God, and maybe right now they don't and they can't, 
because they're hurting. 135 meals of fasting. Hey, God, this is for little David. God, this is for little David. I don't expect them to fast. I'm fasting for Hadamohan. I'm fasting for them. Why? Because they don't see God, but I see God. I hear God. I feel God. Hey! I don't see it, you Come on. You never stop. You never stop working. Come on. Never stop. You never stop working. I can take five people in the altar up here. Anybody need a fresh anointing? Come on. Get on the stickers. Lift your hands. And let me tell you God is here. I see God. God is here. You never stop working. Hey. Even when I don't see it, you work. 135 mil. In the name of Jesus, I see a God. I hear a God. I feel a God. He is in the house. He is here and he is well. Hey! Lord, all things are well. I bless her. I pray for a healing virtue in her body right now. This week, God is there. This week, God knows. This week, I don't know what to tell you. Call to these things. Hey! Hey! Miracle worker, come on! Yes, 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 in the name of Jesus. I bless her situation. I bless her past. Hey. Listen here. Listen. Yeah. You're working. You never stop. Come on, I see a God. Even when I don't see it. Even when I don't feel it. You're working. Hey. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop working. You never stop working. 